My name is Susan Goldstein, and I'll be moderating this session on how destinations can benefit from the $200 billion market that is youth tourism. We'll start the session with a, a presentation from Samuel Vetrock. He is the CEO and founder of Student Marketing, which is a market intelligence and solutions company serving governments, associations, and destinations in the youth, student, and educational travel industry. Following his presentation, we're very fortunate to have with us an illustrious panel of speakers who represent various destinations, governments, and associations within that space. I'll just present them by name briefly now. At the end of the presentation, we'll be asking each of these distinguished panelists to comment on the findings and particularly to comment on the impact of youth tourism on their organizations. We have um, Yolanda Perdomo, who is the director of the UNWTO affiliate members section. They are the only section under the UN umbrella to have private industry members, of which student marketing is one affiliate member. We have David Chapman, who is the CEO of the Wise Travel Confederation. Before that, he was involved in hotel and hospitality. He's been with Wise Travel in an executive position for the last year, and before that, another seven years on various boards. We have with us Callum Kennedy, who has a 20-year history in youth and student travel with BUNAC, the organization, and was just recently appointed the uh, CEO and director chairman of BETA, which is the British Educational Travel Association. We have. As you can see, we're hitting all the key youth travel destinations. We have with us Carolina Sante, who is the executive director of the Student and Youth Travel Association, which is an American organization. She's been with them for three years, and before that was in the um, meetings and conventions business, association business. We have with us Nick, Nick Greenfield, who is head of youth travel activities at ETOA, the European Tour Operator Association. And he's been a tour guide for 18 years in a previous life for his sins. Okay. We have Mr. Greg Klassen, who is the new CEO of Canadian Tourism uh, Consortia. And he has recently joined the consortia and is spearheading new initiatives in youth travel. And we have Frank Ufen from Student Hotel, who is very involved in the student travel accommodation sector and very embedded in uh, profiling Amsterdam's impact and contribution to youth travel. Have I now covered everyone on this panel? Yes, and with that said, I give you Samuel Vetrak. Hello to everybody. Uh, thank you, Susan, for the uh, introduction. And I will follow with uh, 12 slides of uh, uh, basic introduction and use travel. Our ambition today is to give you an idea and understand the use travel as such, and then how you can benefit from um, connecting with this uh, 200 billion sector. So first I will describe it, then I will proceed to what to do how to, uh, how to do it and tap to it. And we will follow with some examples how destinations or various, uh, if not the most important stakeholders in industry work with use travel uh, nowadays, thanks to the panel. Um, before we go there, uh, I just wanted to uh, ask you and mo know more the audience a little bit. So I wanted to ask you how many of you represent any kind of destination here? So please raise your hand. If you represent a city or a country or a state or a province or region, okay. Do we have tour operators here? So tour operators, raise your hand, okay. And uh, do we have media here? So can media raise the hand? Okay, some, good. Okay, so knowing the audience a little bit, I can adjust uh, what should be said. So. 
Let's proceed to the second slide. So use travel um, is worth um, $203 billion is the market value. Uh, it represents roughly 20% of all international arrivals and counts 217 million arrivals. The growth has been 4.8%, which is in line with overall growth in tourism. If the growth continues as is, in 2015, the use travel will be in arrivals more significant than business travel. So this is just to give you an idea how use travel is no more a Nietzsche, but how significant it is and will be in upcoming years. Also behind my back you can see uh, how the use travel will grow in upcoming years and will, will overcome uh, 320 billion uh, level of uh, receipts in industry by 2020 per annum. Um, Okay, let's talk about the used traveler as such. <clears throat> Most of the used travelers obviously go abroad to uh, leisure, visit friends, um, relax. But unlike many other global tourists, more than 40% of used travelers go abroad for meaningful travel, to study, to work, uh, to experience, to explore means that uh, they stay longer, they spend more time and money in the destination um, and are more interesting for the destinations as they stand, stay longer and spend more time and money. Um, as you can see, 60% of them are still students. The other 80% uh, have graduated from a third year level of education. So when we talk about international student travelers, we talk about educated people who do roughly 2.2 trips per annum. One long-term trip or long-haul trip um, with uh, seven and more nights and one short, 1.2 short trips per, uh, per year. Roughly, we talk about 98 million used international used travelers. That's the cohort to target if you are a destination. They spend an average $70 per day. And what is more important, uh, they stay longer, in average over 50 days. Therefore, in total, they spend more than a global tourist that uh, they spend on a level around 1300 per trip. Um, the lifetime or lifelong traveling budget for an individual in today's world is roughly around $80,000. Used travelers are at the beginning of their purchasing decisions for travel. So when the destination, and that's the first uh, point I would stress for destinations, if the destinations capture the used traveler at the beginning of the, the traveling life, um, they can easily capture the traveler or seal the traveler for later because um, the used travelers return as business travelers or leisure travelers later on with family, with friends. Uh, therefore, there will be multiple spending during their life and they fight for the $80,000 budget per traveler. The young travelers will spend much longer than the adult travelers um, due to their age, obviously. What um, out of the many features we could talk about regarding used travelers, uh, what is not surprisingly very significant about them is that they use social media more than emails or um, telephones, texts, Skypes. Namely, when they travel, 35% of them communicate daily through or via social networks. Only 15% of them do email or any other uh, communication channels I mentioned. The other uh, features that uh, are not mentioned on the screen is that 26% of them use uh, uh, or fly to their destination, which is increasingly significantly. Why I'm saying this is the, that the, the travel expenses are the biggest chunk of money they spend when they travel abroad, so it's not accommodation or local spendings. It's over 34 percent. 
So the destinations that uh, open a good low-cost connections for uh, young people to come in, they actually create the best promotional tool for themselves. 32% stay in hostel, 31% in host hotel. So uh, it's not like they abandon hotels. Uh, the hotels are quite used as well. Now we go to uh, why do we invest in used travel, be it time, effort, or money? Used travel is quite resilient to economic downturns. It has, uh, the, the history has proved the fact that um, young people have not stopped traveling abroad during the economic downturn, actually the opposite. Uh, when uh, there is unemployment or uh, there is a difficult economic time in their source country, they actually go abroad and spend time abroad. It's not a luxury good. It's actually something that is integral part of their lives and they travel as soon as they can. I mean, if they have money or time. Um, young people travel to non-mainstream destinations more than the average tourists. So it's again, uh, a good opportunity for destinations, non-mainstream destinations, to have more tourists because used travelers are more likely to visit them than any other group. As I said, number three, they stay longer, spend more. In some destinations like Australia, over 70 days per trip. Um, and um, as you will see in uh, case studies I will feature, uh, they spend over $7,000 per trip thanks to the fact that they stay longer. The appetite to travel is growing. The destinations that work with used travelers now reach the 40% uh, visitor rate. So 40% of their international visitors are now youngsters. Uh, the ones who don't may reach level around 15, 17%. Uh, but uh, once they uh, entice or tease the used travelers, they come back with their friends and they uh, increase their appetite to visit their destination and travel. And the last point, uh, the destinations can create an affiliation with a traveler in, in their young stage, as I said, and influence their further travel intentions. I already said that. So over here, we can see a worldwide map and some examples. Um, What's the proportion of used travelers per destination, be it country, state, or city? Uh, and as you can see, uh, some of the destinations like UK or Amsterdam or New York that are working with used travelers quite intensively, so they have, uh, they recognize this group. Um, they uh, made a strategy, they made an initial investment, not necessarily financial, uh, but they focused or targeted their marketing efforts they are now reaching quite good uh, numbers of used travelers. Um, and I'll show you two case studies, two examples. One is Australia, who is probably uh, the first one started working with uh, used travelers. The average visitor spends $4,879 in their destination when they come. However, the used visitors spend 7000 7, and more. Altogether, the used travel market, international used travelers have a market value of $11 billion for Australia, which makes the sector the third most attractive export for the country. Um, in other words, as they started uh, with this target group, they uh, made statistics on it, they made the uh, marketing strategy, and now they try to attract from selected source markets the, uh, the number of suitable uh, young people. They are now able to reach quite significant contribution to their economy in monetary value, so economic impact, as well as the social impact because they attract talent. We'll get there with uh, Next uh, case study, as I mentioned, New York. So as you can see, 30% already, so the average is 20%, but New York has 30% of all visitors are younger than 30 years. They represent a cohort of 2.6 million used travelers, 25% return, which is quite high. 
and what you cannot see over here, but these 30% represent 40% of revenues. So the young people spend more than the adult travelers, mostly on shopping in New York uh, and sightseeing. It's a uh, best possible evidence that used travelers are no more uh, cheap travelers. Uh, they, however, spend more than others. Now, a case study is Spain. is a th hypothetical case study. Spain is reaching uh, the ratios of 17% of used visitors out of all their international visitors. And if they only reach the average 20%, and as you can see in a blue circle, they would earn additional $1.8 billion revenues just to match the average. If they go even higher and reach the average of uh, Australia, who has been working with used travelers last 10 years quite intensively and strategically, they would earn for their economy 5.3 billion additional revenues. So there's an example how destination can benefit e economically. The other uh, case study is the city of Amsterdam uh, to show you how this, the, the city can, can be enriched uh, socially or get the benefit of the social impact. Amsterdam is doing quite well when it comes to international visitors and uh, the 40% of them are young visitors under the age of 30. So they have 1.7 million used uh, travel visitors, but they, the city is not able to convert these tourists to students and later on to citizens. That's the challenge there. So they only have uh, 6,700 uh, 6, students, uh, whereas other cities who have less visitors but have more students. Why I'm saying this? Simply, um, there is sort of a pathway. If, if the young people come as tourists to the destination, 1,000 such visitors spend roughly 1 million euro in the destination. If they stay as students, they spend roughly 10,300 uh, euro per year. Means 10, 1,000 students mean 10 million contribution for the city, usually spend four times, four years in a row. And if some of them stay as citizens, they become a taxpayers for life, which for European cities with decreasing uh, demographic is extremely important. Um, so I wanted to show you this pathway from tourist to student to citizen that uh, for cities is not only important to get them as tourists, but also there is a long-term vision um, to benefit from, uh, from their visit. And getting to the last two slides, um, a social impact of use, international youth travelers. Young, young people who travel tend to achieve higher economic results. So there, there have been several researches done over their social impact nationally or locally, not internationally, unfortunately, so far. But the national research has proved that um, the international travel has positive impact on academic performance. Um, as well as the travel makes the world a better place. Means that uh, international travel makes uh, young people more tolerant and respectful to other cultures and therefore a safe place to, to live. We have less wars thanks to international travel. And, um, it uh, enhances the global competition and mobility for talent. So if people, if, only if young people s travel, they explore new places and study abroad and work abroad. And that's how the cities or countries can attract talent. The last slide, if you are a destination, what you can do? Um, The destinations that we have worked with so far, there is no universal pattern what to do, but 
I can share an experience. The destinations that have been successful, they first started with market intelligence and research. So they needed to identify what do we have here to offer, for whom it is attractive, how can we communicate this. So the, the research about the, the value proposition and source markets that it might be appealing to, it then continues to strategic marketing plan. Australia, for example, has a fantastic plan. It's not a coincidence um, that they succeeded. They knew where they want to be. Afterwards, there are plenty of uh, other opportunities. Unfortunately, we don't have so much time to go through all of them. But I will, I will stress only a few of them. The easiest thing for destination to attract students is to some. First, make a good flight connections or other connections, affordable connections. Uh, that's the easiest thing how you can attract. The th second thing is organize a student event or a youth event because some 50% of youth travelers make decisions to travel abroad ad hoc. They don't plan. They make a decision out in circumstances or if they have a reason. So that's the easiest way how to attract youth travelers. The other th strategic ways are uh, you definitely need to get in touch with source markets. So uh, basically you can offer as a destination some scholarships or internships to move the talent to you. Or uh, you offer a good use travel accommodation supply. So you need to have a good affordable accommodation because accommodation represents a quite good chunk of money they invest when they travel abroad. Means that if you have good supply in city, you can uh, actually make them come more. Um, you can do um, trade missions, fam tours for the student tour operators who send students uh, in hundreds or thousands. That's a very good tool that has uh, proven successful. And obviously, uh, you should do social, uh, mobile, and online marketing. No way we can go to details, perhaps uh, uh, during the panel, but uh, as I indicated, the social platforms, mobile platforms are more used uh, by used travelers than the desktops um, or telephones for calling. Um, should you have more questions, that uh, uh, we will be here at stand 104 in this hall. Uh, and we will elaborate this content as well as here now during the panel. Thank you. Over to you, Susan. Thank you, Samuel. Well, that's a lot of food for thought and very little time to think about it. So I'm not going to waste any more of it. I'm going to start with you, Frank, because you're from Amsterdam, and we heard about all the things you're doing to move people from this um, tourist to student to citizen category and what it's meant to your organization, which I named as a hotel, but you're also involved in a project called Class 2020, a hint that they're talking about students. Frank, what is your organization, your hotel, doing to engage with young people to get these results? Um, well, thanks. Um, well, our organization is basically looking at facts uh, that Samuel was presenting. Um, we are currently active in the Netherlands with three locations. We invested over 100 million euros in the last two years, and we're looking to expand to 5,000 units. Uh, until 2016. For us, this is a huge growth market, and where we're really depending on is you being interested in the places where we have our hotels. So this is where I think we immediately connect with a city like Amsterdam. As, as it was shown, 40% of the, uh, you, uh, of the uh, tourism market is driven by youth, and what we are doing is basically to try to keep them longer. So accommodation can play a role in it, but also working together with the city of Amsterdam, working with investors, working with um, uh, 
uh, education institutions to put the city on the global map as a destination to come and study and possibly even work. And it's, it's, I'm actually flying out like straight after this because we're debating this today at the city council and we're, um, the city is looking to either double or triple the number of international students in the next four years. So it's really reaching momentum and we see this across Europe. So that's why uh, I think it's a really great moment to look at it. Thank you. Clearly, if you're going to get students, you need to have a place to house them. So keep doing what you're doing. <laughs> okay. Um, Carol Ann Asante from CITA. We heard that you've got 30% of your arrivals coming from this segment and 40% of your revenue in one of your member cities, New York. What have you been doing? Um, what I think is really exciting um, that is part of the student market is the growth in the younger student, ages 10 to 18. We have seen globally a real increase in the younger student, um, which is quite unique. Um, this is a student market that is driven by a teacher, an educator, a parent group, a church group. Large numbers of younger students are traveling internationally as parents want to make their kids more competitive. And there's some stuff around global intelligence, a cultural intelligence quota where parents worldwide want their students to have a little bit more of an edge. And by having them travel while they're in middle school or high school is bringing them that edge when they get to college. So it's a new market and it's growing. Thank you, Carol Ann. Well, Greg Klassen, new man at Canadian Tourism, we've heard that you're now up to 20% and going strong and growing. You've just joined the organization. How are you engaging youth? I'm sorry, I'm just, I'm not new to the organization. I've been there for 12 years. Forgive so it's me. my fault that we haven't been invested in the youth <laughs> program. Um, but I am new as the CEO of the organization. And you're going to change it. I, I, I am, after I see those numbers of 20% up there and, uh, and, and chase Australia a little bit. Um, so this is a new market for us. Uh, we've been asleep. I think we're awake now. Uh, we're getting increasingly engaged in this market. Um, we know in spite of our not being invested in a national way uh, for Canada uh, for this market, we've actually doubled our market share in the last five years. So there's a natural momentum for youth travelers who have discovered Canada. We've got thousands and thousands of experiences that we think appeal broadly to the youth. Uh, we've just never put an umbrella brand over it and targeted specifically that market. But uh, after today, I guess that's, that's going to change. Good news, good news. Callum Kennedy, you are now chairman at the British Educational Travel Association, and we heard Samuel talk about how destinations can leverage research. Can you tell us how you've done that? Uh, certainly, Susan. Um, but f first of all, a bit of introduction about BETA. BETA is a, a specialist association um, for organizations involved in the movement of students and young people into, out of, and uh, within the UK. Um, one of our objectives is to highlight and raise the profile um, of youth student and uh, educational travel. And w when you see the figures up here of 40% arrivals, uh, our youth and student arrivals, it's tempting to think, well, that must be very easy because if there's that many people coming into the UK, then surely the, the, the profile is high. It is within the market and it is within this room. One of the issues that we are facing and one of our challenges is to keep that, the profile of youth and student travel high at city, regional and national government level. And one of the, the difficulties with doing that, and I'd be interested to know if other people f find this, is that the, the term youth and student travel market includes so many different elements from higher education at the top, as they would put it, to backpackers at the bottom, as they would put it. So uh, I, I, I think having a strategy to raise the profile is a little bit more challenging in the UK than perhaps outsiders might actually think. Um, higher education to some extent takes care of itself because it's such a huge earner for the UK. It gets its own attention. The English language market, to some extent the same, um, but it is viewed with a little bit of suspicion because of a history of visa abuse. 
and then going further on down, the, the area where BETA is most involved in trying to raise the profile is in structured programs, youth and student travel, accommodation and travel in general. Um, I could go on and I have probably enough for, for, for this session, but I'll come back later. Well, that's something maybe some people will want to respond to as we continue the discussion. But in order to keep going, I'm mindful of the time. We've talked to some destinations now. We're going to now ask Nick Greenfield, who's with ITOA, which is a European organization, how they're engaging youth in a broader regional area. Nick? Um, yes, hello. Good afternoon. Uh, firstly, I would say we're very well known for our workshops. So, for example, every June we have an event called City Fair, and this really chimed when I was asked to sit on this panel because you've got to imagine hundreds of tables of cities from all over Europe, and among our members and among the people attending are going to be youth travel sector, and they're going there. And as a city, I think it would be easy to say, yeah, they're coming, fantastic. But actually, and I know from personal experience from guiding for an American company for many years, um, the operators, the shareholders, the teacher, uh, sorry, stakeholders, the teachers, etc., are looking for more from a destination. So I would say to destinations, go out there and learn from the operators what they're looking to put in their programs. Don't just assume and go out there and find out what they're teaching in the case of educational programs and make sure you can deliver. And a great example, very quick one, uh, which is all about experiential travel. That's the big buzzword in the youth sector at the moment. So I would go to Florence, they would do the sightseeing and then they would learn how to cook for example, this sort of thing, or go to Vienna, learn how to dance the waltz. And so with our workshops where we bring people together, hopefully the destinations are learning from the operators, learning from the people that deliver the product, what they need to be offering in their cities, countries, regions, and so forth. Thanks, Nick. Um, it's interesting that we're getting very different vantage points from destinations all engaged in the same sector and segment. So I'm going to move on and get more of an aerial view. And we have a global association here, which is the Wise Travel Confederation. And maybe, David, you could tell us not so much how <laughs> the segment is benefiting your destination, which is the planet, but something about what you're doing with young travelers. Yeah, the Wise Travel Confederation covers um, pretty much all of the market segments involved in youth travel. So we, we look at all of the areas, including accommodation and budget accommodation for travellers. We look at uh, work experience and the work exchange market and the, the social and cultural benefits of people being able to travel. Um, au pairing, insurance, all, all of the different aspects that are involved in, in youth travel. And I think one of the big things that, that we're interested in is actually getting everybody, and just as Callum was saying, getting everybody to realise right the way up through the chain, right the way up to government level, that youth travel is not a niche market any longer. You can't describe something that's worth $200 billion as niche, and yet we're still called as niche and we're still dealt with as niche. And I think it's becoming more and more important for everybody, destinations to understand, the operators to understand, that there is some tremendous value in, uh, in the business. And the, the value is not just in terms of cash. It's actually the, the, the education of young people, the, the rounding of young people, and it gets them to um, experience other cultures. And all of the research that we've done over the years, and we've just published New Horizons 3, which was a... Uh, a research of 34,000 young travellers. And one of the big overriding factors that they gain from this is uh, a, a roundness and a self-understanding of their own capabilities and their own constraints. It makes them better people for employment and, and we're seeing, them that, seeing that they are able to go and get uh, better jobs from it and again proof is, is very much here that those that have traveled and experienced this become you know much better employees and have much more fulfilled and, and successful lives thanks David that leads very nicely into um, what I think Yolanda from UNWTO is going to tell us about why the affiliate members are engaged with youth travel and what their aspirations are again from this umbrella organization we're all working under. 
Yes, we have a, a number of members who are directly connected to youth uh, travel. Actually, WISE is also an affiliate member. We have Hostling International, Student Marketing is an affiliate member. And we have issued a number of publications in the past dealing with this very important segment, which has for the World Tourism Organization a very important social dimension. We had one um, in 2005. Uh, it was a research on youth tourism among national tourism administrations. We issued one in 2008 on youth travel um, and the understanding of the global phenomenon of this um, important segment. And in 2011, we did one with WISE, uh, the power of youth travel. And it's so infor important for us that uh, last year in the General Assembly of UNWTO, um, a, a document prepared by the affiliate members called uh, on recommendations on youth travel was endorsed by the whole General Assembly. This was done in August of 2013 and there were a number of issues there uh, to uh, really promote this important part of the travel industry. And, and you were telling me earlier that your focus is primarily on these social contributions whereas we've been hearing a lot about revenue and contribution, but the UNWTO is looking specifically at? Absolutely. Uh, for us, uh, this segment creates social cultural understanding. For us, um, it's, a, it's a very tangible contribution to peace. What he, uh, Samuel said before, that uh, travel makes the world a better place, I think is especially uh, uh, significant in the case of uh, young travelers, and that's what we're looking at. We are also having a look at the rest of the components, but for us, the social dimension is absolutely key. Thank you. We understand now how each of you are engaging with the segment. Can I ask you to tell us a bit about what the impact has been in your destination, for those of you who have a destination, okay, and what your future plans are, how you're going to continue to build on this, and I think we can all comment on that. So I'm going to start this time at, at the other end. Greg, what are your new plans? What are you going to bring to this table? Um, well, we're actually seeking um, incremental funding from, from our government. Uh, to help us invest in this program and we're actually starting it off as a, a domestic program. Uh, we're doing that for two reasons. One of them is it's a little easier for us to get funding to support that uh, and because Canada is uh, celebrating in 2017 the 150th birthday for our relatively young country uh, and uh, we're trying to mobilize Canadians to travel within Canada itself. Um, Canadians are the sixth most uh, frequent worldwide travelers. We love to get out of our country and see the rest of the world, uh, but we think Canadians should actually see a little bit of Canada before they do that. So this initiative will help support that and help us create the kinds of celebration uh, that 2017. We will have a party in every single town and city and resort and ski village uh, across our country, and we know that tourism loves a party. Uh, and so we'll invite, we'll put that marker on the ground for 2017, invite the world's youth to come and party with us, party with a Canadian, um, and, uh, and, and, and enjoy uh, that. But that will be our marker on the ground. And from there on forward, once we have that tr youth infrastructure in place, uh, we think we'll be ready for the rest of the world, and 2017 will kick that off. We'll be waiting. Okay. And the party's not just for the youth. Uh, I was going to ask. The big kids can come too. Thank you. <laughs> That's good to know. Frank, what about Amsterdam? Um, well, as I said, the, I think the, we're raising the bar in the city of Amsterdam for the next couple of four years, and we're looking to work with other partners uh, on that and, how, uh, and pro with Samuel on the strategy um, that will require uh, uh, us to bring up the numbers. From the student hotel, we're, um, yeah, we're announcing in the next couple of days a number of new projects. Uh, as I said, we're going to 5,000 units in the, uh, in, in the Netherlands, and then we're looking to go abroad. So hopefully we can welcome all of you at the student hotel Berlin in a couple of years. Um, for the class of 2020, I think um, the main uh, objective will be to connect higher education, tourism, and the investment community in Europe 
And that, that platform can be very strong for cities that are currently dealing with the economic crisis in Europe especially. We came out with a report called The Next European Renaissance, and we believe, as everybody probably know, higher education is usually the first entry to a city for everybody um, here in this room. And that's a, it's, it's a really strong economic card that you can play. And so we're looking as a platform to advise and engage with other cities and uh, work together on uh, increasing the uh, number of talent that they can uh, attract and retain. That's great. Carol Ann, it seems to me that that notion of how you build future higher education starts earlier, maybe? Yeah, it does. And, and one of the points I wanted to bring up with the research and and for a lot of destinations. We know that many students all want to see the top destination, so they're coming in through the large cities. Um, but really, how do we take the students and have them visit other cities, other destinations within a country? We, you know, we represent over 150 cities and destinations, for example, in the United States and Canada. A lot of the key to that is to look locally at your university, at events, what can you do that a tour operator or an educator can offer to a teacher that gives some added educational value? Do you have a monument? Do you have a story to tell where they may come in through a major city, but then take an afternoon for three hours? So really our challenge is to take students not just into the major destinations, but really to spread them out. Um, to all the other wonderful attributes that your country or, or your regions may have. And that really starts with a purposeful educational package that requires the city, the university, attractions, restaurants. We really have to do some good packaging to really spread that market, those, those students around um, your areas. Thanks. Nick, I think you have some plans too. Uh, yes, well, firstly, to continue to expand the, the workshops that we do they're very concentrated, speed dating, but a lot of, the, a lot of good stuff comes out of it. Uh, and I think through things like City Fair, it's a chance for destinations to get educated. Uh, secondly, to work with associations like Beta and CITA and Risenets here, uh, together on Common Cause. Uh, and I think particularly important to pick up on what Callum said, um, it's, the travel industry is very good at talking to itself. Most industries are very good at talking to themselves. Um, we're not always so good at talking to the wider world out there. So I think that's a, a fundamental point that we have to do everything we can through people like Samuel to show the worth of the sector and to highlight the importance of the youth travel. Also because those people could be the people who are in this hall in five years time running their own exciting companies with innovative ideas. Don't, don't, don't forget that. The future careers uh, are made through this travel area as well. And uh, finally, my final point's gone from my head. I'll stop there. <laughs> okay, a wise man to stop when you're done. Okay, um, Callum, what about Beta? Well, I, I, actually, Beta and the UK, I, I think, share um, some aspirations and objectives for the, the, the years ahead, um, primarily to keep you lot off our tail, because. Um, <laughs> You know, we, we have a, a, a solid position at the moment, but we know that there's potential for growth to this 300 million arrivals figure that get, keeps being mentioned, and we want a share of that. And you can have a share of it too, but we're going to have a bigger share of it. And one of the things I think that, that Beta and the UK can, can do together is it's all to do with the quality of the experience. We know that young people don't consider their experience to be complete until they've shared it with somebody. And they share it not at the end of the experience, but they share every single moment of it. And therefore, the potential to make the experience good or negative exists all the way through the trip. And I think the beta members are... Uh, one of our objectives is to continue to maintain the quality of the experience that we are offering to young arrivals, because that creates its own multiplier effect. They talk to other people. A good, a good experience creates two to four more experiences, and I think that that would be our objective. The, the other thing I'd like to mention is also um, the, a, a safety issue, which hasn't come up yet, but uh, working with organizations like ChildSafe in order to keep um, the, the safety and the well-being of younger travelers uh, to the forefront, I think, is, is also essential. 
And one of the concerns of Beta, I understand then, to, to support and help develop and drive. Indeed. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, we've heard a lot of talk about partnerships, destinations talking to each other, and destinations talking to operators. So, David, um, for WISE, uh, what are your plans on a global scale to engage more with youth and maybe support that? Um, I think that's quite a, a difficult question for me specifically to answer simply because um, we have 800 members that are doing exactly that. What, what we try to do is to give them the ammunition. We try to give them the information so that they know how to, to deal with all of these things. And, you know, particularly something that Callum was just saying uh, now about talking, uh, allowing, allowing the traveller to talk during their uh, experience is very important. And we see things like uh, free and ready avail availability of Wi-Fi to be a, an essential thing. And that's something that we've been pushing through with our members because then people can talk about and, and blog and, and tweet about their experiences as they're actually happening. And it becomes a very free um, and quick form of advertisement. And so we take all of that information, we take all of the, uh, the statistics that come from our reports and we feed those back into our members and get them to encourage, uh, sorry, encourage them to, to, to push those particular points to help the destinations in turn to attract the young travellers. So we sort of try and push it from the top down. So you're giving your members the tools Absolutely. in which to engage. Okay, thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Information is king. <laughs> okay. And Yolanda, the UNWTO affiliate members, what plans do you have for them in the future? What can UNWTO do to engage more thoroughly with youth? What we want to do is to apply what the General Assembly has endorsed through those recommendations on youth travel in practice with our members. Uh, and to do that, we have engaged uh, with uh, Hosteling International through a memorandum of understanding, uh, through a number of initiatives to make that possible. We are doing the same uh, with WISE. Actually, we're going to be present at their international event in Dublin next September, and we will do so also with the student marketing. Uh, what this uh, recommendation uh, are, says is uh, basically that we have to help on the following. Uh, youth travelers have a positive impact on destinations, that facilitation youth travel is potential to contribute to the development and advancement of societies. I mean, this is all very nice, but it's theory. We want to apply it in practice through our members and through a number of projects that we can carry together. That's the main objective. Theory into action sounds very good. Well, do any of you have something very special and important you'd like to add? Now, there's a question that'll put an end to all conversation. <laughs> Okay, in that? I, I have a comment, if I may. Great. Something that came up in uh, Sam's presentation, which I looked at, and it was the, the comment that um, travel makes you cleverer, makes you brighter. And uh, I, I was thinking about that and wished I traveled further. Um, but I, I wonder whether there's a cause and effect issue there. Is it that the young people who go on, particularly on um, organized structured programs actually might be brighter in the first place and therefore it, it, is there a way and you may not have got to this stage yet of measuring in a sense educational value added from where they started and finished it's probably too complex a question but it's a delightful query um, one likes to think that there's a self-selection perhaps especially those of us who traveled when we were young but uh, thank you. We'll think about that. That's your next research, Sam. No, okay. no, no, not actually. Uh, the answer would be simple. We will, be, we will know soon because we're working with, uh, namely, Saita on a huge research, which uh, very wisely uh, included <laughs> a social impact. Uh, so very strong part of the research, over 1,000 uh, respondents is um, social impact. So I think within a couple months we will know uh, whether it's a chicken or egg at the beginning. In that case, we'll see you back here on the stage next year. Thank you. Okay. Um, I just, Caroline? one thing on as a follow-up, 
You know, what we found is that um, we have a foundation that actually awards scholarships. So really, the opportunity to travel needs to be for all students. And we have to work to really make that happen. There are a lot of underserved, underprivileged, a lot of schools and students who just don't financially have that opportunity. So if we say that travel has an impact and that travel makes them more global citizens, then travel has to be equal. And so how do we as a community really help to fund those opportunities for all students worldwide? And so I think that's another important piece of keeping them safe, making it affordable. And as a part of this study, we're hoping that teachers, whether they're traveling or not, if teachers and educators believe that it has an impact, then hopefully governments will help it and school districts will help make it affordable for all students. You know, and then we'll really be able to make a difference. Thanks, Carolyn. Anybody else? Yeah, I was just going to pick up on the um, uh, on the education side from from Callum's point, and I think there's it, there's a degree of self fulfilling prophecy with this in that you've got the people that that travel and the people that we've researched all say that they gain tremendous self knowledge and self awareness um, as a result of the of the travel experience. They gain cultural understanding, and I think. You know, it is chicken and egg. Were they were they more intelligent to be able to make that or make that assumption, or, or were they able to um, produce that because the experience helped them to? But I think what we've what we also need to look at is purely the fact that it happens. You know, these people go, they do travel, they do understand other cultures, they they gain a, a, a thirst for more travel. It it becomes a perpetuating circle. Uh just to be clear, I wasn't trying to make a generalization that only bright people travel. Uh, and that wasn't my point. It was just that it was the educational that, that it adds to your academic ability. I, I fully accept, and I'm with Caroline on the fact that as many young people as possible should be given the opportunity yeah. to travel. That, that, that wasn't, you know, I wasn't questioning that at all. Um, I wasn't picking you up on it either. <laughs> if, if I can indicate our. Uh, I think, as David said, they made uh, quite significant research over 34,000 uh, student and youth travelers. And I think that research indicated that, this, as I mentioned, 60% of those are students and 80% educated from third year de degree. So I would see a correlation over there. Um, and I think the research will actually prove that uh, the education and travel goes hand in hand. Uh, just personally, having taken hundreds of groups around Europe from the United States, you even see it in the course of a trip. You know, you, you have the ki I've had the kids on tour who uh, is a little bit sort of, you're thinking, oh my God, you know, the first day he's telling me how he misses his car, honestly. Not his family, his car. And by the end of it, he's really sad to be leaving Europe. And I, I hear constantly, unfortunately, I've been doing this for a long time now, from kids who tell me, oh, I went to the University of Siena, like you suggested, or I work in the travel industry now, or even, I've, I'm, a, I'm a tour guide myself now. So, so I personally, it's only anecdotal, of course, but I have done a lot of tours. It's amazing, the transformative nature. And this is really, really important message we need to get out there uh, to everybody, uh, just to stress again, particularly people at political level, there's a danger with youth travel that they think it's cheap, uh, it involves drinking, it's not worthwhile, etc., etc., etc. We really need to talk about the worth, and the political uh, decision makers need to understand this as well. Because some of the decisions they take, for example, with visas, with the new emerging markets, really, really affect this sector. And I don't think they really properly understand at the moment what we're talking about here. I agree about the higher education side, but the youth travel side, I'm not totally convinced that they really understand. That's our big challenge. Okay. Come on, fine. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Okay, I'd like to ask if anyone in the audience has any questions for our Sam or our panelists, now that we've all spoken to you. No questions? Okay, well then thank you everyone. I think we have gone over, and if there are no other closing comments, Sam? One closing comment. Okay. Um, First of all, I want to thank all the panelists that uh, found time to come over here and be a contribution for uh, all of us. Uh, I think it says a lot that we have uh, such a great panel and such a great attention. Um, as well as I want to thank ITB to providing this platform for youth travel. And um, at, the, at, the, at the end, I would say that youth travel, uh, 
coming out of the research background, seems like this is the sector of tourism that might have the most impact out of all of the sectors because not only economically uh, and socially and moving the talent, but also long term for generations. So I believe that uh, used travel will be even more significant within tourism at vice versa that the used travel will be contribution for the tourism long term. Thank you.